The following show was recorded on the 7th of February 2012, and more information can be found about Ray Pete's work at raypeat.com. That's R A Y P E A T.com. Hello, and welcome to Politics and Science. I'm your host, John Barkhausen, and this is part three of a discussion about progesterone and Dr. Raymond Pete's work with progesterone over the years. Uh, Dr. Pete, for those who don't know, has a Ph.D. in biology from the University of Oregon and with a speciality in physiology and uh, has done a lot of research in the fields of endocrinology and science history. So, uh, Ray, welcome once again to Politics and Science. Hi. So in the last two shows, Ray, we covered some of the history of and your work with progesterone. Uh, This week, I'm hoping we'll be able to cover some of the politics and economic pressures affecting the science of progesterone. So to start this off, uh, in spite of its proven anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory effects, progesterone is now deemed a carcinogenic substance under California's Proposition 65. So I I guess my question is, how did this turn of events come to pass? Yeah, the proposition uh, says that you can sell carcinogens in any form that you want, but you just have to uh, quote the law that says uh, this is known by the state of California to cause cancer and and or birth defects and and such. But it isn't a law against selling carcinogens, just that you have to warn against them. And uh, the uh, partly driven by lawyers who were given the opportunity to uh, enforce the law instead of the state lawyers could uh, make uh, collect the fines themselves. Uh, they chose to uh, interpret the law to mean that the presence of anything which could be carcinogenic in any other situation uh, it makes a product uh, require the warning so that uh, it ended up that parking lots were, had to be warned that they were carcinogenic. Uh, the public had to see a sign if they went into the parking lot. What was, uh, the, Brian, what, what was the rationale for the parking lots, Ray? Uh, oh, it was either the paving material or the, the fact that there were cars there emitting uh, exhaust fumes. Oh, my God. And, uh, chocolate producers were sued. Uh, manufacturers of drinking glasses that had uh, paint on the outside uh, uh, bread manufacturers, uh, potato vendors, vegetables, any, anything that uh, there was a whole wave of uh, these insane prosecutions and lawyers made a lot of money. Um, and you know, the, the real function of, of that law, uh, besides enriching the lawyers, uh, it was to put the warnings everywhere in the produce department of grocery stores and on apartment buildings and on fishing tackle and and hardware and so on, so that uh, it became a joke. Uh, Everything was labeled a carcinogen, so uh, the carcinogens became invisible. The real carcinogens were submerged in this uh, phony uh, warning business and uh, it was still legal to sell carcinogens, but since everything had the warning, uh, the public basically wasn't warned against the real carcinogens. And uh, physicians could prescribe the carcinogens as long as they were uh, under under a doctor's orders. Huh. That's a brilliant, brilliant strategy on the part of business, it sounds like. Uh, yeah, and very bad for the public. Yeah. And um, the, it has been brought to the attention of the, oh, the Attorney General and, and so on. And uh, the, the, the lawyers basically are in control of the government so that uh, anything that would impair their ability to shake down the public uh, doesn't interest the um, law enforcement people. Um, I, I gathered some evidence and um, asked the Attorney General if uh, 
nonprofit corporations aren't supposed to uh, uh, take uh, money from industries to destroy their competitors and such. And uh, I gathered up evidence that made it look pretty clear that that was what was going on. And, uh, they said, if I can prove that they have committed a crime, they will investigate. <laughs> <laughs> so if you do all the work... <laughs> then they would just investigate it and say they would <laughs> prosecute it. And I didn't quite follow. What does a nonprofit have to do with it? Um, the the um, nonprofit organizations were being formed uh, either as fronts for lawyers oh, uh, to, to extort money or as um, I couldn't prove it because I couldn't <laughs> subpoena the, the documents, but uh, it on its surface, it looks very much like the um, competing industries are uh, using those organizations to get rid of uh, progesterone, among other uh, products. Sure, that makes perfect sense. So they basically form kind of a cartel and go after their competitors. Under the, It's a very strange law where you, it sounds like the Wild West, where you just anybody can deputize themselves and go after somebody else to enforce that very open-ended law. Uh, yeah, and uh, the, the state prescribes the, uh, the type of penalty that they can get. Uh, I forget, it was like $50 for each drinking glass that was uh, sold without a warning. Wow. I re- and it was a, a huge amount of money, millions of dollars that the lawyers have collected. That's, that's so s- Kafka-esque. And it, it sounds so ridiculous, but it actually has serious repercussions for uh, somebody who's trying to sell a product that they think is is helpful. For instance, what happens to you if you don't obtain the California seal of approval of not being a carcinogen? Um, if you don't have um, 10 employees or more, the law doesn't impl- apply to you, so you legally shouldn't be able to oh. sell anything without a warning, except the lawyer's ignore that. They go ahead and extort money from people who, who just on the face of the law, it can't be applied to. And do they do they threaten to pursue you uh, in court if you don't uh, pay them off, or do they actually... Oh, yeah. Oh, they do. They, they First they threaten you, then they pursue you. Uh-huh. And, uh, then they <laughs> keep it going for years. So, uh, so it's, I, ba- it's basically extortion, I guess. Yeah. yeah there, if you Google... Uh, shake down lawyers, California. Uh, you'll get some of the history of it. Mm, okay, I had no idea. And because I, in our state, I think it carries quite a bit of weight. If you don't, if you're listed as a carcinogen in the state of California. Um, yeah, the California lawyers were getting big money from foreign corporations, even outside the U.S., because they do business with California, and uh, yeah. California has such a big economy that. Uh, they control the world. Yeah. Okay, well, that sort of sets the context for the legal environment in California. And and when did you become aware that uh, progesterone was going to be uh, um, coming under the sights of these guys? I, I guess about uh, 10 or 15 years ago, the, uh, some of the manufacturers started uh, labeling uh, the progesterone itself, known by California to be a carcinogen. But, so, uh, so it was already a done deal when you first heard about it. Um, yeah, uh, I think it was 1987 uh, when when the uh, uh, California Review happened. I'm not sure of the the date when the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment is what California's board is called. They mm-hmm. call it WEHA, O E H H A, and uh, I. They weren't willing to give me uh, the names of the people who were their qualified experts by their definition who made those decisions. But uh, the law requires them to either uh, just automatically list it because World Health Organizations or National Toxicology Program uh, list it. They could just defer to them. But in this case, they decided to have their board of qualified experts look at the relevant uh, evidence and um, out of oh thousands of, of publications on the issue of cancer and progesterone 
that they picked out about a dozen articles that they said was the relevant decisive evidence. And of those, uh, several of them weren't even progesterone. They were birth control pills and things that contained no progesterone at all. Uh, they, they listed them as the relevant evidence, but when I got them to uh, send me copies, they weren't even about progesterone in several cases. And then uh, the ones that did involve progesterone in the research, every one of them was uh, totally incompetent as uh, toxicology or science or cancer research. Uh, they were clearly manipulated to to get a case against progesterone, but they failed in every case. Um, they, they had had only one outside uh, person testified during the meeting, Richard Edgren, and they asked him why he had chosen to testify, and he said, because progesterone isn't a carcinogen. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, then he, he went over uh, some of the studies and mentioned that uh, one of the studies using uh, non-progesterone chemicals had produced some uh, tumors that weren't uh, metastatic, uh, but uh, it, he wasn't in that moment talking about progesterone, but the chairman of the committee heard him say metastatic, even though he had said they weren't. Mm -hmm. And and since the topic of the meeting was progesterone, even though Edgren wasn't talking about progesterone in that case, <laughs> that was the basis for making the decision. Like if the Marx Brothers couldn't have been sillier. Yeah, yeah, or, or Kafka couldn't have been more surreal. Yeah. You said Richard Edgren, they asked him why he had chosen to testify. It sounds like he wasn't even going to be there, except that he was concerned with this. Yeah, um, because um, he pointed out that if you call non-carcinogens carcinogens, then what's the public going to think about real carcinogens? If you're going to ruin the whole issue of public safety if you blur anti-carcinogens with carcinogens. And w one of the, the studies that they listed as evidence uh, proving that progesterone is a carcinogen the article introduced itself by reference to some studies by Alexander Lipschutz, who had published many papers and a book uh, describing the anti-tumor properties of progesterone. Yeah. And th uh, this article referenced that and said that they were checking up on, on Lipschutz's work. But Lipschutz, in his paper that they were referring to had specified that progesterone given continuously prevents or even sometimes reverses cancer. And in this paper that they, the California considered evidence of carcinogenicity, they gave intermittent progesterone treatments exactly what Lipschutz had said wouldn't prevent cancer. Mm -hmm. And they concluded it doesn't prevent cancer. That was all the paper consisted of, a bad <laughs> reputation of Lipschutz's evidence that progesterone prevents cancer. And California presented this, uh, <laughs> this strange non-refutation of progesterone as a cancer preventive as evidence that it causes cancer. Again, it, it's... <laughs> yeah, it's bizarre. But very very effective. It sounds like, you know, nobody's going to question it because they're the experts. All that was there was the title. There were a panel of experts. It was probably the receptionist who looked up some titles that had cancer and progesterone in them. And they just figured nobody's ever going to care or look into it. Yeah. And that's because there's no money behind making uh, progesterone, as you pointed out in an earlier show, so that 
they're not really stepping on any big toes when they do this, except uh, the people who are actually benefiting from the use of progesterone. Yeah, and um, around the time that um, someone petitioned to take progesterone off the list, and that petition was rejected because uh, the person in charge of responding to the petition uh, mentioned a study that was done at the World Health Organization Cancer Research Agency mm -hmm. as having shown that, that uh, progesterone was a carcinogen. So I looked that up, and the people at the World Health Organization said they didn't know of any such thing, but they looked carefully and finally found one with the same date that California had cited, and it wasn't about progesterone. <laughs> What, what was that, it about? That, uh, um, synthetic progesterone. Oh, uh -huh, I see. And California had cited that one obscure article, not about progesterone, to refute the petition that uh, had presented evidence that progesterone protects against cancer. But uh, that, that was just a way of saying, no, don't bother us. At the point that I asked them who made the decisions that were decisive, mm -hmm. even though the decisions violated their own regulations, the head of the agency uh, said, we don't have the resources to answer your questions anymore. <laughs> like, go away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Please go away. You're bothering me. <laughs> yeah. And around the same time, uh, someone petitioned to remove saccharin from the list of carcinogens, uh, and uh, there's a lot of evidence that saccharin is a carcinogen, and uh, the California decided to remove it from their list on the basis that uh, the reason it causes cancer of the bladder in rats is peculiar to rat bladders, and that it's sort of a crystallization and the uh, concussion caused by falling crystals <laughs> under the wall of the bladder. <laughs> uh, was, basically, that's what the argument consisted of. They had no evidence that uh, it was the, the contact of crystals with the bladder, but they found a paper that said it, it does cause crystallization in the bladder. Yeah. But they, there are also articles that showed that human uh, the urine crystallizes in exactly the same way the rats did, so there was nothing special about the, the rat crystals. Yeah. Uh, it was just, again, uh, the reaching as far as they could not to see the evidence, and mm -hmm. so they took it off the list. Um, again, just as false in the other direction to take saccharin off the list because it's a big industry moneymaker. Yeah. So it sounds like they're there to represent certain interests and basically be a filter for what becomes uh, available to the public or not, based on those interests, not the public's interests. Um, yeah, that, that's their public. The, the corporations are the only public they're concerned with. Yeah, and I recall from your newsletters that some of the tests they cited against progesterone, some of them were progestins, as you said, and you explained last time that progestins actually have Many of them have opposite effects of progesterone. They're synthetic progesterone, and they don't. Are they considered synthetic? Is that the right term, progestin? Um, well, yeah, they're synthetic, but they are, they're a different molecule, so they aren't progesterone at all. Right, okay. And they're, the, the, the industry got the FDA to allow them to call them progestins, even though they are good contraceptives. They prevent gestation, but... Because there is a, a change in the um, lining of a rabbit uterus under their influence that happens to coincide with the changes caused by progesterone, at least in one or two features. Mm -hmm. um, on the basis of that, they call a non-progestin a progestin. It, it's a contraceptive, but they can see one feature of overlap with progesterone. So that's the strength for calling them a progestin. 
I see. And for those who didn't hear the first uh, two parts of this uh, talk about progesterone, uh, Dr. Pete was telling us that many times uh, progestins are prescribed. People think they're taking progesterone, but they're actually taking these uh, different molecules named after progesterone, but actually do not have many of the benefits that progesterone does. Did yeah, I cover in that? 19, yeah, in 1970, when I was working on progesterone, uh, Occasionally, someone would uh, say, did you see the paper uh, in some big science magazine that progesterone causes cancer? And at that time, they were actually putting it in the title, progesterone causes cancer, but they weren't working with progesterone. They were just, uh, even the editors of science journals were letting them get away with uh, calling things by what by false names. And... Uh, but by the early 70s, <clears throat> uh, the, the science world <clears throat> had uh, clarified their terminology enough so that they started uh, consistently calling the the other molecules progestins or progestogens. And so there has been much less uh, scientific confusion about the terms, but medical doctors are still pretty well confused about the difference between the um, anti-progestational progestins and the real progesterone. And consequently, the public's also very confused because I know a lot of people who are taking uh, estrogen with progestins and they think they're getting both uh, progesterone and estrogen. And... Yeah. Natural progesterone has to um, carry the warning that it can cause heart defects because uh, some of the things that are called progestins cause heart defects. And so something that has one property of progesterone gets to be a called called a progestin. And then anything toxic that molecule does gets laid over on real progesterone. Hmm. And and that prevents uh, for example, uh, women with epilepsy uh, are told to avoid progesterone during pregnancy because it'll cause heart defects. But uh, actually, the real progesterone uh, has been reported to prevent almost all birth defects when it's, it's used before pregnancy. Hmm. And as we talked about in the earlier shows, most of these rulings seem to be connected to the estrogen industry, which just one drug alone we were talking about last week, Premarin, I think, uh, was $2 billion in sales roughly uh, before the World Health Initiative test became public and estrogen sales drop. So uh, Dr. Pete was saying last week that as estrogen sales dropped, uh, progesterone sales were going up, and this alarmed the industry. And consequently, it seems like there's a move against progesterone. Um, yeah. Um, and you, you can see it in um, some of the uh, traditional centers of estrogen-promoting research. Um, they, around that time, turned uh, uh, against progesterone instead of concentrating on on how good estrogen is they're uh, stretching to find something bad linked to progesterone hmm. that's very interesting um, who is sitting on these boards Ray where, where do these people come from do you know any of them or have heard of them or oh um, I looked up uh, everyone on the board and uh, and, and we're, ta we're talking about the board that decided what was a carcinogen in California. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, some of them were linked to the uh, the university uh, that was uh, doing the anti-progesterone research, and uh, the um, the leading uh, anti-progesterone guy was Malcolm Pike, and uh, he and one or two others formed a company to promote a birth control pill based on, on uh, his idea of uh, uh, protecting against progesterone. And the state of California was um, using uh, federal grants and other uh, funding to support corporations, his included. Uh, so... So government money was flowing into his anti-progesterone business while he was sitting uh, influential in uh, saying that progesterone is a, is a carcinogen. 
and uh, everyone I looked up on the board uh, was uh, either directly or indirectly concerned with with something uh, competing. Uh, for example, one of the people was on the board of a company uh, promoting uh, transdermal uh, medical treatments, uh, the things that uh, will administer drugs through the skin uh, while uh, most of the progesterone products were being delivered through the skin. Uh, the, this um, person was representing a company that would, would um, probably be in line to um, market a, a, a medical progesterone transdermal. I see. And and what uh, universities were they working for? And what were their fields of ec- expertise? Were, are they physiologists? Do you know? Uh, uh, the, uh, most of the, there was only one biologist on the committee and several toxicologists uh, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, University of Southern California has I think the biggest concentration of, of anti-progesterone work um, I, I looked at the USC website about five six years ago and I found uh, easily uh, I think it was 140 references to the glorious properties of estrogen, and uh, I found I forget numerous, but not not a competitive number. Numerous references to progesterone, but every one of them was about its harmful properties. And if you look at them objectively, you have to uh, look hard to find a, a, an objectively beneficial effect of estrogen, and you have to stretch very hard to uh, find uh, a harmful effect of progesterone. Is the contents of this library because they've called it, or they've just always cultivated articles with the right attitude as far as they're concerned? Uh, Well, the things on the website were um, uh, research projects uh, in in progress. I I think they were all in progress. Right, so they're being funded through the university, probably from pharmaceutical yeah. research companies? Yeah. So that's uh, basically the, that university has come down on the side of the pharmaceutical companies that are funding them, in short. Yeah, there are, there are, there are several uh, labs around the country. Um, uh, Berkeley has uh, more recently... Uh, moved in that direction. Michigan was was a big center of estrogen research, uh, and uh, some of those people moved to um, UC Berkeley. And interestingly, the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory is involved in anti-progesterone research, which seems to have grown out of the uh, chemical warfare uh, line of line of thinking. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's a that's a weapons lab, basically. And and why are they interested in uh, estrogen research or anti-progesterone research? Do you think? Well, uh, it obviously, would be for benign and harmless purposes. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, are they affiliated with businesses? Do you know? Ray? I don't know anything about the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. I, no, I think it's all government money. Well, one of the things you've written about uh, Elwood Jensen, who's uh, <coughs> the supposed uh, inventor of the concept of the receptor protein, the uh, hormone receptor. Is that right? Um, he, he invented that, that concept? Yeah. Um, uh, there were the idea of receptors in general was um, being discussed. Uh, in various fields, um, but for estrogen, uh, the enzymologists were um, progressing very quickly uh, uh, in understanding uh, the effects of estrogen and molecules like estrogen through the 1940s into the uh, 1950s. And uh, one of the lines of uh, very productive research was showing that use 
and change estrogen back and forth between estrone and estradiol. Uh, estrone is relatively inactive. Estradiol is very active. And uh, uh, that, that was classified as, as enzymology. And um, uh, Jensen's argument was that uh, it, estrogen acts by uh, activating a genetic program, and so it's only a female uh, acting substance because uh, females are genetically determined to be female. And so what estrogen does is act on a receptor that activates a genetic program. Hmm. And if, if, if something is acted on by enzymes, men have enzymes that are going to uh, do the same reactions. And uh, enzymology tended to generalize the estrogen issue uh, and uh, make it a, a masculine problem as well as a female. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, Jensen got the only uh, support from the Atom Atomic Energy Commission, which controlled the isotopes, needed to do uh, enzyme studies. And he uh, used a, a, an isotope labeled form of estrogen. And uh, in his experiments with uterus tissue, claimed to show that there was no oxidation or reduction of estrogen by the uterus and said that's the end of the enzyme tradition. It's all receptor and genes now. Hmm. And that uh, spread through the research world uh, and by the mid-1960s was the dogma. Uh, but then the enzymologist started getting the same isotopes that he had had and showed that, in fact, the old 1940s research was exactly what's happening. And now everyone knows that estrogen, estradiol, and estrone are perfectly interchangeable. And that's exactly where progesterone and thyroid uh, and, and the stress hormones interact with estrogen. Uh, progesterone turns off uh, some of the enzymes that activate estrogen and uh, activate enzymes that inactivate estrogen. So uh, the enzy enzyme approach uh, opens up the whole issue of environmental, physiology, nutritional, metabolic mm -hmm. uh, effects on the estrogen system and the estrogen's deranging effects on all of those systems. Uh, so that's all now coming back, but 50 years <laughs> of um, belief in a, a genetic explanation of, of why estrogen is so good for females and harmless to everyone else. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 had, I had trouble. Um, if you got too fuzzy on that last sentence. I couldn't understand it. Yeah, I was saying that uh, Elwood Jensen, uh, the reason I brought him up is because you mentioned Livermore Labs, and he uh, worked in the chemical weapons industry. Isn't that right? Um, yeah, uh, University of Chicago, uh, I think is where he was working, and that was a big weapons laboratory. Uh, the, the government uh, doesn't say much about their chemical biological warfare research, but uh, if you look at the careers of, of some of the famous biologists, uh, you see that they're, uh, you can't explain their achievements other than that they were uh, being pushed by the Pentagon to uh, get the information that they needed for, for germ or chemical warfare. So uh, just to put a political context on, on Elwood Jensen's work, uh, and relate that to science, you're saying that uh, the fact that he was able to shift the damage that estrogen does to the genetic causes, that sort of removed the liability of uh, government pollution uh, and yeah. industry pollution away from them to basically random genetic problems. Yeah, the, um, until just, I guess, about 25 years ago, 
biologists uh, thought about estrogen, working on the estrogen receptor as simply activating femaleness in genetic females, and uh, Mm -hmm. that therefore it would act only on a uterus or a a female breast or uh, the female pituitary, uh, as if uh, a a man didn't share practically all uh, enzymes and genes with women. Uh, yeah, it, it was uh, just just an extreme case of of genetic cleaning up of the uh, dangerous possibilities. Uh huh. And the actual reality of of how things work. Yeah, um, estrogen uh, has been known for uh, about thirty or forty years to act on every kind of tissue. Uh, you can find the estrogen receptor everywhere, but even without the estrogen receptor, you can demonstrate that it works on any kind of tissue. Um, And uh, some of the estrogenic compounds attach to the so-called estrogen receptor, but some have estrogenic effects without touching the estrogen receptor. So uh, really, uh, it should have a new name. It's the, uh, the sometime estrogen receptor activator mm-hmm. system, but, but it, it isn't really the, the, the crucial thing because you can get estrogenic effects from radiation or cyanide or suffocation or various stresses and infections and so on. They'll all bring on estrus and uh, swelling of cells and, and uh, activation of the uterus and so on. Inflammation. Um, yeah. And the um, overlap of of, um, stress and radiation and uh, uh, industrial smoke and so on with estrogen, uh, that's one of the things that has been uh, carefully avoided, and the the receptor idea uh, is crucial in in covering that up. Yeah, it sounds like what he came up with was a very sort of uh, smoke and mirrors uh, cartoon for uh, selling a concept of how everything works in, in such a way that it fit in with the popular idea of the gene being how life is directed. Um, and people may be wondering why we're talking about estrogen when this is a show about progesterone. And uh, Well, estrogen uh, in the physiological situation activates the um, production of progesterone, and then progesterone uh, knocks down the production of estrogen. So it's it's a, a matter of an occasional uh, stimulus from stress or estrogen, which turns on a system that then uh, definitively gets rid of estrogen and leaves things operating for the rest of the month. And uh, it's only the exaggerated prolonged effect of estrogen that becomes a danger, and progesterone is is the basic thing for getting rid of um, estrogen. And if you look at the enzymes involved, uh, progesterone inactivates the aromatase enzyme that produces estrogen from the androgens, and it activates the two types of detoxifying enzymes, uh, the glucuronide transferase and the, the sulfur uh, uh, transferase uh, that attach uh, the sulfuric acid to make it water-soluble. And it, um, estrogen opposes those, and progesterone inactivates the estrogen-activated enzymes that uh, remove the detoxified sulfate and glucuronide. Hmm. Um, so it's just an amazingly comprehensive system that progesterone does, and only real progesterone uh, does that uh, so systematically. Uh, it it knocks out the uh, production and um, maintenance and activation of of um, estrogen, and it even destroys the so-called estrogen receptor protein. Uh, so at the action end, the production end, and all of the intermediate steps, progesterone systematically destroys 
the estrogen system. And that's one of the reasons that progesterone is so universally important. But it's the the opposite side of why estrogen is so universally dangerous. Mm -hmm. Um, Progesterone even protects against radiation uh, as part of that same system because radiation imitates estrogen and the cancers produced by uh, either uh, radiation or estrogen, these are equally uh, protected against by progesterone. So it's, it's a comprehensive, uh, protective substance against the um, the full range of uh, biological uh, threats. And uh, Elwood Jensen, the uh, inventor of the estrogen receptor, that concept, and he goes on to talk about his work. It was apparent to him that very small amounts of estrogen cause cancer, and that was his challenge, is to figure out why that was. And he went on to try to discover other chemicals that... Uh, opposed to estrogen, and he came up with tamoxifen. I think everybody knows that has a lot of bad side effects. A a man named Dan Lednesser uh, gives a a more uh, uh, insider view of of where tamoxifen came from. And uh, the people who were working on the, uh, the fact that estrogen is likely um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons Mm -hmm. in causing not only cancer, but inflammation and and fibrosis. Um, They were looking for anti-inflammatory things because uh, the uh, polycyclic hydrocarbons and estrogen uh, create inflammation. Uh, And looking for anti-inflammatory things, uh, they accidentally found that uh, tamoxifen was anti-estrogen as well. And out of that uh, line of research, according to Dan Lednesser, uh, uh, even Celebrex, the, the uh, uh, what do you call them, the COX-2 mm-hmm. inhibiting NSAIDs, uh, uh, even these derived from that line of, of research that was Oh. thinking about a, a more basic view of, of what estrogen does. Uh, the, the, oh, the, go ahead. Yeah. The, re, the receptor wasn't involved at all in that kind of thinking. Okay. Um, well, maybe I, I could be uh, misquoting Elwood Jensen, but it sounded like he, he was involved in something to do with tamoxifen. And, but the thing I didn't understand was it's been known for a long time that progesterone uh, – does oppose estrogen and does it so completely as you've pointed out and so why were they even bothering to look for something else that's what puzzled me I think you have to uh, imagine uh, the mentality of uh, like uh, his the person he said suggested the looking for um, uh, how the estrogen affects the tissues uh, was Charles Huggins um, Huggins uh, was, um, I think he founded the lab that that uh, Jensen was working in. And uh, according to Jensen, he gave him the, the idea. But I think you have to uh, see what flakes they, they were, even though it was the University of Chicago. Uh, they They were just totally unaware of of the world of biochemistry as related to cancer uh, i don't i don't really know how it was possible you'd have to uh, have a detailed biography of of how what courses they were teaching and so on but uh, huggins is the guy that uh, theorized that uh, since um, you know, he read a textbook in which they made the rooster grow uh, its comb uh, by giving it testosterone and the classical things. And so they said, uh, since testosterone makes a man uh, develop a prostate gland and estrogen makes women develop breasts, if you want to stop the growth of cancer, 
in the breast, uh, you will either remove uh, estrogen or give uh, testosterone. That, that was his first suggestion, I think. And f for the prostate, you would uh, either castrate the man or give the man estrogen or both because his simple idea was that the female and male were opposites, and so if you give the opposite hormone, you will uh, antagonize the growth-promoting effect of their hormone. Basically, a completely idiotic idea at the time he proposed it, but no one was there to tell him so. That immediately started doctors all over the country castrating men by the millions, and for, I guess, 45, 50 years, uh, they were giving men estrogen uh, with or without castration to treat prostate cancer. All on, on that uh, very ignorant uh, early 20th century idea of opposition of the hormones. I had no idea that that went on, the castration. Uh, yeah, and uh, Huggins uh, was the one who... Uh, besides proposing castrating men to cure prostate cancer and giving them estrogen, he uh, first proposed removing the ovaries uh, to uh, stop the estrogenic stimulation. And then since um, uh, some of them didn't recover from that, he uh, took out their adrenal glands as another source of estrogen. And... Uh, that was practiced up right through the 60s, I think, until about 1970. Nice. Uh, and uh, at one point, Huggins even uh, proposed uh, treating breast cancer with estrogen. Uh, just uh, didn't make any sense, but he had sort of a Frankenstein mentality. Uh, let's tinker with things and maybe we'll come up with something. And, and he saw everything in just black and white. Yeah, like. and that that's the mentality that Jensen was working with. Uh, and he, uh, you know, I, I think it involved basically uh, either incredibly bad science or deliberate fraud for him to say that estrogen absolutely wasn't being metabolized in the tissues where it where it was having an effect, mm. and that was that was his proof of the that it acted only through the receptor. Well, that uh, reminds me of H. L. Mencken saying that for for every complex problem, there's a simple, simple, concise answer that's absolutely wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And perhaps we only have about ten minutes left, I believe. Um, it would be. Uh, good for people to hear about how progesterone does work in combating cancer. I don't think we've actually talked too much about that. Mostly we've talked about its anti-inflammatory effects, but and maybe you could cite some of the uses it's actually had uh, with success. Uh, well, um, Alexander Lipschutz was the person who did the most uh, comprehensive work showing that <clears throat> where estrogen uh, causes fibrosis, uh, fibroids uh, first, and eventually uh, cancer. It, it acts first on the uterus, then on the breasts, then on the lungs, kidneys, brain, and it's just a matter of where estrogen concentrates that it uh, tends to cause uh, fibromas and cancers. And in every one of those situations, uh, progesterone was protective, and now it's known that it, it has this uh, about, I think, nine different mechanisms by which it eliminates the estrogen problem. Uh, so the, uh, the cause and effect outcome was defined by 1950 by Alexander Lipschutz, and, and then the more detailed stuff is still being developed. Um, an Italian uh, has done some very good uh, work looking at the, the range of things progesterone does defensively. Uh, someone named Mendelssohn has done a lot of uh, work on the uh, protective effects of progesterone against estrogen. But the, uh, uh, the, the, the full reason of why uh, 
progesterone is is protective against cancer, uh, you have to look at the the whole spectrum of what estrogen is doing. The first thing estrogen does is uh, cause the cell to take up water, and and taking up water uh, stimulates cell division and uh, fat production and a lot of other enzyme activities. Uh, these effects uh, happen within minutes of the time of estrogen exposure, and so anyone looking at, at simple uh, tissue biological experiments way back uh, 80 years, as soon as they had uh, a concentrated estrogen-like material, they could see that it instantaneously was uh, causing uh, the tissue to take up water and begin producing fats and other substances and to divide. Uh, so it, it, it takes uh, at least several hours for genes to get activated and uh, cause cellular changes. So obviously the, the receptor wasn't involved in those instantaneous effects of estrogen. And those are exactly what uh, the essence of the cancer problem is. If you uh, start an inflammation that causes cells to keep taking up water, uh, in that stressed condition of um, activating cell uh, chemistry, they're using energy faster and uh, uh, the, the uh, stimulation of cell division is is tending to use up the supply of oxygen and sugar. Uh, in my thesis research, uh, one of the things I did was show that adding estrogen to a system such as the uterus lowers the oxygen tension. It just sucks the oxygen out of the system, and so it kills the um, embryo that's uh, trying to implant if there's a little too much uh, estrogen or not enough progesterone. Uh, so that stimulation creates an oxygen deficiency, and as far as sugar is available, the sugar will be glycolyzed to produce emergency energy in the absence of enough oxygen to meet the stimulation. Mm. The glycolysis produces lactic acid. The production of lactic acid uh, leaving the cell raises the pH inside the cell, <clears throat> and that increased pH keeps the swelling going on, activates cell division, and expensive energy. So it, it needs something from the outside to uh, stop the production of lactic acid and deliver oxygen and so on. Uh, progesterone is one of the essential things for stopping that process. But once it starts under the influence of estrogen, you get uh, the lactic acid production, which creates a vicious cycle of cell activation. And the lactic acid acts as a, it increases the supply of, of blood and uh, spreads uh, growth of blood vessels into the environment, so it it activates everything that you need to produce a tumor, and it, all that's needed is the absence of an anti-inflammatory uh, energy-restoring substance, such as aspirin or progesterone, to stop this process. If you don't have those available, the lactic acid uh, stimulates surrounding cells to change their physiology uh, in ways that um, you have a, a progressive uh, uh, increase of the malignancy behavior of the cells. Um, in, in the simplest situation, an injury causes the lactic acid to be produced, which activates uh, the energy changes and growth to heal the wound. But at a certain point, uh, the system should come in with the anti-inflammatory substances, such as progesterone, to uh, finish off the healing. Hmm. And in the absence, the healing attempt at healing simply goes on and uh, creates this swelling and oxygen-deficient situation. And if you uh, grow cells in a culture dish and deprive them of oxygen just by having them uh, in a, a, a dish without good circulation, uh, they will eventually 
uh, mutate and uh, form other types of cell that uh, cause a derangement and alteration of the tissue type. So uh, all of the steps of, of cancerization uh, can be seen uh, structurally and metabolically in terms of wound healing that can't be brought to completion. Oh uh, yeah, that's that's good. I like that. And and I think Harry Rubin, you've pointed out, has basically proven that it's that uh, cancer is not from a gene gone bad, but rather the the uh, tissue itself has developed an unhealthy state. It, could you? We have a couple minutes. If you could maybe cover that briefly. He has just um, uh, honestly uh, summarized the, the real cancer research, showing that uh, the deranged metabolism and structure is what causes the chromosomal damage. So the um, instead of uh, genes causing the tumor, the tumor causes the genetic defects. Which is the opposite of what we hear basically every day in our popular culture when people talk about cancers. Yeah, and uh, when, a, when an oncologist or pathologist says your tissue shows abnormal cell division and the wrong number of chromosomes and such. Uh, if you, they said that means we have to cut it out and irradiate you and so on. Uh, but if you look at the fate of those deranged cells, they're going to live maybe to the next attempt to divide. Then they don't have the right number of chromosomes and the, the halves will die. So mm -hmm. they're, they're very short-lived once they get to that deranged state. But the death of the cell contributes to the inflammation of the area. And so stopping the inflammation and energy deficit is always the, the solution to the problem. Uh, when it's now recognized by some oncologists that the reason a malignant uh, cancer reforms after they've irradiated the area or cut out the cancer or both, the reason it reforms is that uh, stem cells are called into the inflamed area that has been treated. And even if you irradiate a healthy area, it will call stem cells in to try to repair the wound. And if the radiation deranged the uh, fibrous material in that area, you'll produce a cancer from the irradiation. Uh, so whenever you injure a tissue by removing a tumor, you're just guaranteeing that the body will try to repair the wound by sending in new cells, mm. which then turn into cancer cells if the area is still sick. Yeah. So the way to actually heal or to stay healthy is to make sure that your cellular environment is a healthy one. Yeah. Um, so for anti-inflammatory uh, substances that people can use, uh, progesterone is one of them and aspirin is another. And, uh, and antihistamines. Okay. Going way back 50 years, people were seeing that antihistamines would occasionally cure cancer, but that just didn't catch on in the profession. Aspirin, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, when I would mention it to someone with cancer, they would think I was, you know, like the doctor saying, take an aspirin and call me yeah. later. <laughs> Call me from the next life. <laughs> but, but, but you're saying that progesterone and aspirin are actually viable cancer treatments. Uh, yeah, and some of the antihistamines are definitely protective. All right. Well, if people want to read more about this, they can uh, find out lots of Ray Pete's ideas at raypeat.com. That's R-A-Y-P-E-A-T dot com, where I think, Ray, you said you had 70 articles up there or so. And, and uh, Yeah, I'll be putting about a dozen more up in a couple of weeks, I think. That's great. It's a beautiful website, by the way. I, I love the sombrero and the ice cream. Cake. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah. And we have been talking to Dr. Raymond Pete, who uh, has a Ph.D. in biology from the University of Oregon and with speciality in physiology and also uh, has done extensive research in endocrinology and science history. And as always, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you, Ray. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. We Okay. Okay, thank you. That wraps it up for Politics and Science this week. Please tune in again next week for another edition of Politics and Science. Podcasts can be found at radioforall.net.